<clears throat> All right, we are back. This is hour two here on Wednesday. Uh, keep in mind all these uh, things here coming up, especially what? We got test four looming next week and the final. So, yeah, very busy time for you to keep track of this. Uh, we'll, we won't do too much on 28 lipids. We've already seen some lipids with the acyl triglycerides and the fatty acid synthesis. So we'll just show a couple things there. The two main chapters are, of course, the amino acids and the proteins and the sugars, what we're talking about now in 27. So let's uh, review a little bit on the disaccharides and show you a little bit here on some reactivity with the disaccharides and how it's a little bit different, we could say. We can take this disaccharide, which is what? Maltose, and it is in the down position here. So this is alpha maltose. And if we take alpha maltose, treat it with excess methyl iodide and sodium hydride, what are we going to do here? We're going to deprotonate each alcohol and form what? The methyl ether again. So this is an SN2 type reaction via the O minus, the alkoxides at every spot. So yeah, this takes a little bit of time to draw this again, <laughs> but you'll see. So ether there, methyl ether there, there. Those are all methyl groups, all CH3s, right? And then we have the alpha linkage here four position over to the other uh, primary alcohol also gets methylated, methyl ether there, there, there. Wow. So you, yeah, you, typically you, you're dumping in like 50 equivalents of everything here. So it, it goes sequentially. Each one, you know, goes with different time there. But yeah, it's a methyl ether everywhere now. Now we can take this polymethyl ether and treat it with water and acid. And remember we said the regular ethers are stable to those conditions. What's not stable to acid conditions? Right, breaking the acetal and this acetal. We have two now. Uh, this started out as alpha maltose. And here I'm showing the alpha methyl uh, glycoside. But there's also beta there. Why? because this was originally hemiacetal, which was equilibrating with the beta, okay? So we get alpha and beta here for that one. Now the key thing is we're going to hydrolyze here and here and put, what, hydroxyls there, but not everywhere. The methyl ethers everywhere else stay intact, okay? So CH3O there for all those spots, except right here now. Right? We're going to put water in there. How does this work again? Well, we protonate the linkage point, and then that bond is weak. Why? Because of the stability there. We could say the same thing about all these other methyl ethers. We can protonate there and there, but these won't give resonant stabilized secondary carbocations. The only spot where you get the re resonant stabilized carbocation is at the anomeric position. <laughs> That's why sugars react this way. And so you'll get that sugar. Which is, uh, which is, again, glucose with all of them at that position. And we'll get another glucose. But what will its structure look like? It will have uh, the anomeric OH hydrolyzing that one. But look, it participated in the hydrolysis right here at the four position. That will also be an alcohol. And the methyl ethers, you see, will be at all the other spots. This is actually a way in the old days to tell how oligosaccharides were linked. Uh, you'd form the, the per, uh, the polyether, and then upon a hydrolysis, you see where the new hydroxyl was. That must be where the anomeric linkage was then, okay? Because you have alcohol at the four position and then ethers everywhere else except for here, of course. Uh, but that lets you see that. So there are some homework problems like that where you do a couple simple reactions with, with those to uh, see there. All right, let's go back to the overhead here and look at a couple applications, including uh, DNA, RNA. We'll get into that in a second here, but let's do the blood group antigens first. So these are on the surface of your red blood cells. Uh, you probably know what type you are, AB or AB combined or O. And this is a glycoprotein, which is membrane bound. So this is the red blood cell, the erythrocyte. And this is a tetrasaccharide, right? There's four 
sugars here. And what do you notice about this? This is glucose, but it's glucosamine. Uh, in fact, it's, it's N-acetyl glucosamine. At the two position, it has an amine group with an acetate amide on it. <laughs> so that's unique. That's a different type of sugar. And then we have galactose here. Why do we say galactose? Well, it's in the up position right there. Okay. And then we have fucose. We haven't talked about fucose yet. That's a C6 reduced sugar. There's a methyl group out there at the six position. Fucose is, is much less common. Comes from glucose where we deoxygenate at the six position. And then this is galactosamine. This is galactose up right there. And then the amino, uh, the amide right there. And uh, this linkage here is what? At the six position here. So that we can say this galactose is branched, the four and the six position. So you should be able to recognize those structural elements within a, a given thing. Don't memorize all the stuff about, oh, this is A, that corresponds exactly to that one. Just the basics of it. It is a tetrasaccharide and the linkages, oh, okay? So, yeah, don't worry about that. How is beta different? Well, it's just galactose. It doesn't have the galactosamine, but it does have the 1,6 linkage here with the extra sugar. You see the, the fucose, the galactose here, and the, and the glucosamine are all the same down here, the trisaccharide here that's 1,4 linked, it's the same there coming off the amino group. So that is a surface uh, lysine, that side chain, that, that um, primary amine forms the, uh, the glycoside with the first sugar there. That's how it's linked covalently uh, to that. And then it's membrane bound. It's just stuck in the membrane there of that erythrocyte. And then if you're O, oh, sorry, you just have a trisaccharide, so you're not as complex there. <laughs> And that means you're lacking this uh, galactose or galactosamine right here. But everything else is the same, you see. So it's kind of the same. And what are antigens, by the way? They're recognition elements for the immune system. This is the, uh, the uh, adaptive immune system. There are antibodies uh, that go around patrolling the body to see what is self and not self, right? And if you're not self, if you're some foreign molecule, your immune system will ramp up a response. Eventually, macrophages will come in and try to digest everything uh, that's foreign. So <laughs> uh, you've probably heard about the immune system and how it works, the adaptive and the innate immune system. So these are antigens for, for that. And uh, here's the blood type. That's what, what we just looked at, AB or AB. Some people have two. They're the universal recipient people. They can receive blood from anyone there. Uh, O's universal donor, and don't don't memorize that either. You can see why maybe that is now uh, the molecular basis of it anyway. You produce antibodies, part of the immune system that recognize those elements. So uh, if these antibodies recognize something foreign, they'll ramp up a response for it. So you can receive A or O. O is the hydrolyzed, just that axial position. If you go back to the structure, you see this is uh, axial coming down here. So by the anomeric effect, it's easy to hydrolyze that off. And that just exchanges what A to O. Or if you hydrolyze it off here from B, that just goes to, from B to O. So you can kind of see the molecular basis of that. But yeah, so don't, don't worry about the immune system. <laughs> anyway, just recognize what it is. Antigens, meaning these are molecules that are recognized by the immune system. Uh, to see whether you're self or not. There's another blood factor called the RH factor. Maybe you've heard about. Uh, that's a protein-based antigen. We won't get into that. These are the ones that are that are carbohydrate-based uh, antigens. Okay, a little bit on drug uh, design here. We've shown you oseltamivir or Tamiflu, the uh, trade name for it. Uh, this drug's about 15 years old now. It's developed um, when there was a really bad. <laughs> virus outbreak here, a bird flu. So right now we have a bat flu going on, right? The coronavirus. Uh, it's a SARS virus. It's a different virus than, uh, than uh, influenza viruses, which is what this one's developed uh, against. All these an new antivirals were screened against the coronavirus recently, and that's where remdesivir came, came from. It was actually developed previously for the SARS virus. So all of these follow rational drug design now. It binds specifically in the sialidase enzyme that's on the surface of the, on the virus. And this enzyme that the virus uses truncates or simplifies the glycosugars that are on the surface of your cells. And it needs to hydrolyze some of those 
sugars in order to merge with the host membrane and then dump in the genetic material from the virus into the host cell. So the mechanism of, of how viruses infect us is pretty well known. There's a lot of uh, details and ins and outs of how it goes. Here's some virons shown right here. And I'll show you a little bit more of the detail. Here's the drug. Here's the poor birds that produce it. Uh, that new strain of influenza jumped from the birds to us, and that caused the problems here. Um, and, and you look at it, it kind of looks like a sugar. It's a cyclohexene, uh, and it's got some, uh, some uh, polar groups to it. It's a phosphate salt. This, this amine is protonated, not the amide. That's not basic. But this lone pair is an amine. That is basic. So that's where the phosphate salt is. Uh, so this is the actual drug you see right here. Here's how Corey's synthesis uh, went. Corey, E.J. Corey at Harvard published this uh, quite a while ago now. Yeah, okay, there it is, 14, 15 years ago. Uh, it's asymmetric diels alder reaction, amide formation, iodolactamization with iodine. Some of these reactions you can kind of figure out here. Oh, allylic bromination with NBS and AIBN. That's a radical initiator, allylic bromination. Elimination here to the diene, uh, uh, forming the the uh, aziridine ring. Yeah, I'm not going to go through all it. And then putting this group on here, finally, to the drug. It's kind of an expensive drug that's 12 steps, but it's rational drug design. And here's how it was rationally designed. Here I'm showing you the glycoprotein on the surface of an endothelial cell. So these are the cells that line your air passages, your bronchial tubes and uh, the, the, the cells in your lungs, right? So you have a glycoprotein similar to the blood cell antigens. But this protein here has uh, a complex polysaccharide on it, including a sialic acid, which is an eight carbon a uh, a sugar. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And here's the anomeric position of it right here. There's the acetal. It has a carboxylic acid at the one position. And then it's got glucose here that's linked alpha here. But uh, yeah, we got that linkage. This is called sialic acid. And that's the endogenous substrate in your endothelial uh, cells, uh, the surface uh, sugars. And what this sialidase enzyme does, here's an enzyme on the surface of the virus, the influenza virus, okay? So this is a complex picture, right? Here's your own cell. Here's the virus coming in. And the first thing it does is hydrolyze, has an enzyme that can recognize this sugar, okay? And then it can protonate at that position and form the cation, right? The carbocation, the hydrolysis of that. So protonate this oxygen right here, and then use the lone pair to come in and form the carbocation. And there you've broken the bond. And then water can come in there and give the free sialic acid. So that's the rest of the mechanism. And then on your surface of your endothelial cells, the sugar, the glycoprotein simplified. That allows the virus to actually merge with your membrane here and then dump in the genetic material, uh, the DNA, in the case of, uh, of influenza, into your cell. And then that puts the DNA into your, uh, into your own genome, and then it makes many, many virons to the point where your cell bursts open and thousands of new virons are, are released there. But uh, Tamiflu here, the drug, actually mimics this transition state. It's this flattened ring here that actually binds more tightly to the sialidase enzyme and keeps it from hydrolyzing your polysaccharides. So as we know more and more about the mechanism of how different uh, things infect the body, we can design specific drugs that inhibit those deleterious pathways. And in the case of the antivirals, it's the uh, fusing of the viron with the host cell. Okay, so here's the results. Actually, the clinical trials were done using a 1-800 number for Tamiflu because <laughs> you have to get the drug within 48 hours of feeling the effects. Here's the specific assays that were used. They made hundreds of analogs here uh, drug-wise. This one's very similar to the sialic acid. Uh, and, and the lower the inhibition number here, the more potent it is. So here's an assay with the enzyme itself, sialidase. You can run that assay and test the different potencies of the different drugs for that. And the lower the number, the more potent. So this one's pretty potent. 
150 nanomolar, that's the concentration at which it does its effect. You want to have that the lowest possible concentration. Okay, so you can use the least amount of drug and minimize side effects, whatever. This one's not potent. This is going to the cyclohexane ring, getting away from the pyran. But this one, cyclohexane ring, and then adding on a bigger group here, this hydroxyl, and adding on the secondary butyl group made it more potent. 10 nanomol are very potent. In fact, adding on this three pentyl group here on the drug, super duper potent, one nanomol are very potent. And that was the one moving forward to become the drug. Here's the assay with the actual virus, you see. This one initially didn't have much potency. That's a micromolar inhibitor. That's not good. You want ones in the nanomol range. This one here didn't even inhibit the actual enzyme in the assay. So no effect. This one dropped back down and became more potent. Yeah, because it bind tighter, inhibited the enzyme better. And then this one had very good 16 nanomolar activity. This is the actual drug here for Tamiflu. Anyway, that kind of gives you a flavor of what medicinal chemists do uh, using specific assays on a validated disease pathway to uh, figure it out. Usually there's a lot of different assays that are done here. But uh, this one here, you can see. And then the patients, the clinical trials were done. People would phone in and they'd overnight the drug to them. And then they'd report back what their symptoms were a few days later. Uh, usually 90% of people who get the drug within 48 hours had a great reduction of their uh, flu-like symptoms. So very effective drug that way. Here's how it works. Binding to the uh, sialidase enzyme. You can see the purple balls is the drug in the active site where that normally does its hydrolysis of the, uh, of the polysaccharide. The drug forms some tight interactions here and, and functions as a molecular monkey wrench, if you will. <laughs> it goes in there and, and binds more tightly and doesn't allow uh, the endogenous ligand uh, to come in there and, uh, and then the virus can't merge with the host cell. Anyway, it's a great story. Here's part of the innate immune system uh, which actually hydrolyzes the uh, peptidoglycan cell wall of bacteria. And this is in skin, saliva, and milk. It's called lysozyme. And this lysozyme enzyme does just this right here. It takes the bacterial cell wall, which has a poly sugar to it. These are complex sugars, NAG and NAM. You don't need to know all that, but you see the acetal linkages. Kind of looks like starch or cellulose. It's different, though, in bacteria. And this enzyme, lysozyme, that that's in different spots in our body, uh, hydrolyzes that quickly, okay? So you have this innate immunity, uh, this, this defense mechanism here, which is just a hydrolyze. It uses water to break apart this structure in the bacterial cell wall. And here's how it does it. Uh, this, is, this glutamic acid here can protonate the acetal oxygen. So here in the upper right, you can see it getting protonated. And there's some other stabilizing things in here which stabilize what? the carbocation that's resonance stabilized, right? And then water can get in there and there's the breakage. You see uh, the other sugar coming off, the other NAG sugar. Uh, this is a NAM sugar, I think, yeah. Uh, and then uh, water uh, gets on there and that's the final uh, product there. Hydroxyl there and the water there. Yeah, anyway, innate immune system. <clears throat> uh, let's get into DNA, RNA. So here's the final topic. And this is a complex one, right? Uh, you've heard about DNA and RNA, of course, in many other classes. It's in the common vernacular. People even say all the time now, it's in our DNA. And, and I always cringe when I hear that as a chemist because uh, I'm, I'm not sure what's in your DNA. In fact, uh, over 95% of your DNA is called junk DNA. It doesn't code for anything, by the way. Uh, DNA is a very complex molecule. It's what, 23 chromosomes? Uh, in higher in humans, uh, different animals have different numbers of chromosomes, but this is a DNA that codes for everything. So the central dogma of biology is what DNA is transcribed into RNA. That messenger RNA maintains that code sequence to then create the proteins uh, upon translation on the ribosome. You've probably heard of those as well. It all boils down to this four-letter genetic code, T, C, A, and G. And what are they? Well, they're deoxyribose uh, 
glycosides. Here's the nitrogen on the side at the anomeric position. This is an acetal still, but it's an oxygen nitrogen acetal, you see. And why do we say deoxy? Well, it's deoxyribose, so at the two position, there isn't an alcohol anymore. It's just a methylene, okay? The three position has the OH. The four position is part of the cyclic ring now, the furanose. And then the five position is a free alcohol. These are nucleosides. If you have a phosphate on there, those are nucleotides. And we'll see that in a second. But here's thymidine, uh, which is a uh, pyrimidine base. It is aromatic. We can look at that structure and see if you have the resonant structures here, you'll see the six pi electrons cyclic continuous in the ring. It has a methyl group at this position here. Putting that methyl group on is the difference between DNA and uh, RNA it has a demethylated version of that called uracil. We'll look at that later too. And then cytidine is the other pyrimidine, which also has the uh, six-membered ring here, also aromatic, resonant structure-wise. A little bit different structure, right? Instead of this carbonyl, it has the amino group here. It maintains the carbonyl right there from uh, T to, to C. That's how I remember drawing it. I, I'm, I'm not going to make you memorize these structures and make you draw them uh, cold that way, but we'll need to recognize something about the structures to talk about the uh, double helix and and the recognition elements within it. And then we have the purines, which is adenosine and guanosine, which have two rings. This ring, if you look at it on its own, it's a five-member ring with two nitrogen. That's an imidazole ring. Okay, we've talked about that heterocycle before. And this is a purine ring here uh, together, if, if the two are together there. And adenosine just has an amino group on it right here. These are kind of related to, um, to caffeine and theobromine which are also these type of uh, purine structures. But the pattern here, if it's just an amino group right there, that's adenosine or A, okay? Same deoxyribose, that's staying the same. And then if we have the more complex thing, back to the carbonyl that's similar to thymidine here, and then an NH right here, and then an amino group down here, that's guanine. And so base pairing, you've probably heard about that before, and I've got more graphics to show this, but which bases uh, want to be with which now? And this is in the double helix DNA. You've heard about this too, right? The hydrogen bonding, complementary pattern is what? Uh, thymidine with adenosine, AT, and what? Cytidine with guanosine. And you can kind of see the pattern here. It's gonna hydrogen bond on this edge of the heterocycle. So here we have a hydrogen bond acceptor on thymidine, hydrogen bond donor. And that's just the opposite of what we have here. We have a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor. We should say something about the ionization state of these amines. Let's see, under pH seven conditions, is that amine protonated or not? Well, that's an aniline-like amine, right? Protonated aniline has a pK of five, and that's similar to this amino group. So at pH 7, they are uh, deprotonated. This is on the basic side of that pKa, which is 5. So these are neutral, okay, under physiological conditions. These are different than other types of amines. And so uh, here we've got cytidine with guanosine, right, uh, GC. Hydrogen bond donor, acceptor, acceptor. And here we have hydrogen bond acceptor, donor, donor. Okay, so they have the right uh, complementary pattern to it. Now, this structure of the double helix that you know and love here, okay, the Watson-Crick model uh, was proposed by these two, uh, James Watson and Francis uh, Crick. Uh, they were at Cambridge University in England. Watson was an American postdoctoral fellow working there. They came up with the correct model based on base pairing, and it was evidently clear to them how then DNA replication work. How do you create two daughter cells from a, from a parent cell there? You have to duplicate or replicate the DNA. And so as DNA unwinds here, it creates a template to make the new strands that are needed here. So the molecular basis of genetic information and, uh, and gene storage, the gene sequences, was readily apparent to them. It's 1953. This is called the most important paper ever published in the scientific literature. It's a one and a half page paper. This is the first page here. 
showing the double helix arrangement. They actually made physical models here and looked at this base pairing idea. We're going to have to get to that because A base pairs with T and G with C. Okay. How did they propose this structure here? Well, they had a X-ray diagram uh, that came out of the lab of Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin was the famous graduate student working at Imperial College in London. These are close to each other. If you've been to England, I think Cambridge is only like 40 minutes away or so. You can drive very quickly there. Uh, Watson and Crick drove down to Franklin's lab and looked at her diffraction patterns. And they were experts in X-ray crystallography. They could tell from this diffraction pattern that it must have been a double helical type structure. Okay, And they had different ways they could tell just analyzing roughly what the structure looked like. Uh, they caused quite a bit of uh, concern here because they went ahead and published this paper and the correct structure of DNA without notifying Franklin and Wilkins. Later on, Wilkins won the Nobel Prize with Watson and Crick, but unfortunately, poor Rosalind uh, passed away from cancer and did not receive the Nobel Prize. You don't get it posthumously. She should have gotten it, though. Uh, she had a 12-mer double helical form of DNA that she highly purified and then did the diffraction uh, studies on that. So she's well known, uh, receiving credit for what she did. But Watson and Crick put the structure together and proposed the correct thing. There are other things we could talk about. It's a great story. There are books written about it. If you want to read about some great uh, scientific uh, uh, literature, that's certainly uh, right up there. Because everything we know in uh, molecular genetics and uh, and biology in general all comes out of the correct structure of DNA. And here's the key thing, uh, A with T, okay? So they noticed that in all organisms, it always had the same amount of T as A, okay? They could hydrolyze DNA and analyze the individual components, and the percentage T was always the same percentage of A. So Watson and Crick said, well, they must be interacting. Well, how do they interact? Well, they could have this complementary hydrogen bonding pattern. There it is, the adenosine donor, acceptor, and here's your acceptor donor. In this uh, dimeric form, the two hydrogen bonds can be quite stabilizing, especially if you have a bunch of them in double helical DNA. And here's C with G. Uh, here's the donor, acceptor, acceptor. Here's the acceptor, donor, donor. And there's your hydrogen bond, the dashes of the hydrogen bond. And there you got three of them between the two. And in all organisms, this, the, the percentage C is the same percentage of G, okay? Um, so that, and here's the molecular basis of the double helix. It's anti-parallel. You line up the strands here. Uh, these are nucleotides now. You have phosphates that link from the five position to the three prime position. So that's that linkage there. And on the exterior is where you have these phosphate uh, magnesium uh, counter cations uh, that are on the exterior here, going from five prime to three prime direction. And then the other strand goes from five prime to three prime. And we say the two strands are complementary to it, to each other. T with A, C with G, A with T, G with C, okay? So this extends for hundreds, thousands of units, right, in each chromosome. And then they wind up in the chromatid and whatever, and all that information is packaged into each individual nuclei, okay? So it's an amazing molecule there, all uh, 23 chromosomes for us. Of course, it varies depending on the organism there, but they all follow the same pattern. So all life as we know it follows the same pattern, which is an amazing thing, I think, <laughs> you look at it. There are different forms of, of, uh, of uh, helical uh, DNA. The most common one is the B helix that we show here. This is the original one proposed by Watson and Crick. If you tip it on its side, look down the top, there you can see uh, in the middle is where the base pairs are. And on the exterior is where the phosphates are. You can see the oxygens of the phosphate. And then in the interior, you kind of see the blue balls of the, uh, of the, uh, of the base pairs, A, T, G, and C. But there is a, a helix, which is kind of compacted or scrunched down. And then Z helix kind of rotates the opposite way, and it's pulled out. It's extended more. But by far, most, most uh, DNA in, inside the nucleus folded up state is in the B helix. Okay, here's how replication works. And Watson and Crick could recognize this right away because their structure, as you unwind it, and there are helicase enzymes that unwind DNA, 
the strands from the parent DNA, the original DNA here in gray, become templates for making new strands of DNA, right? So there are DNA synthase uh, enzymes, synthesis enzymes that bring in triphosphates uh, of each nucleotide, and it depends on how they recognize. So the next one to go on here, because the template, the next one is C here, the next one that goes on to the blue strand is G, and then the next one is a T, and then you have a C here coming up, so the next one there is going to be a G also. And so it becomes a complete then complementary strand to the original structure here. And so eventually, you know, you keep unwinding and keep making the new blue strands. And then you have the two daughter uh, molecules. And when the cell divides, uh, they're identical that way genetically to each other. Of course, there are problems. There are, there are misreads here. Uh, there are repair aces and a lot of other things we know about replication, but that's how it works. We also have RNA synthesis, where an unwound strand of DNA can make a strand of RNA using a what? Ribo uh, nucleotides. Right now we're using deoxy ribonucleotides to put in the new ones. Okay, So um, transcription to go from DNA to RNA is the same event. It uses different enzyme and different nucleotides. And, and the sugar is different, but very similar. Nucleotides also show up in different cofactors. So here's an adenosine molecule in NAD. Here's the same adenosine type thing in FAD. And even in the acyl carrier protein, acetyl-CoA, uh, there's also an adenosine. Very common uh, use there. But the business end of the molecules are actually on, these, on the other end here. This is kind of a tag or recognition element for the enzymes that that use those cofactors. Uh, a lot of drugs interact with DNA. Here's topotecan, an anti-cancer drug. It intercalates into DNA. So it has kind of a flat region that can go in and, uh, and, and fit in between the base pairs. So here's double, here's helical, double helic DNA, right? The orange thing and the, and the yellow strand. The blue is actually the, the topoisomerase enzyme here, <laughs> which is inhibited. By this, by this drug, but it's sticking in between the base pairs there. Yeah, don't worry about it. I'm just giving you a little flavor for that. Some drugs actually alkylate DNA and form these covalent crosslinks, or these mustard agents. There's this natural product mitomycin here that's, that's known for that. And it actually is, has been used to treat different types of cancer. Doxorubicin, uh, affectionately called red death in the clinic because it has a lot of bad side effects. It's used to treat a number of forms of cancer, but again, it has this flat aromatic region, and it functions by intercalating or, or binding in the in between grooves of the base pairs, and then preventing uh, the DNA from replicating. And that's a hallmark of cancer cells, right? They're rapidly turning over. So if you can monkey with the DNA in a cancerous cell and do it selectively you can shut down the replication of those cancerous cells. And a number of cancer drugs do do that quite uh, selectively, but they do have side effects. All right, translation. How do we go from the genetic material, ATGC, and the order of those base pairs is going to be responsible for producing the, the actual gene products, the proteins, and then making everything else in the cell? How do we do that? Well, it's a process called translation. We're translating genetic material via the messenger RNA into protein. So messenger RNA, where did that come from? Well, that's a single strand uh, nucleic acid material that is RNA. So it's ribose, okay? But it has a lot of them stuck together in the same way DNA does. And it's made from an RNA synthase using DNA as a template in the nucleus. So uh, the mRNA then comes out into the cytosol of the cell, and that's where the other genetic components of RNA are located. We're going to look at tRNAs or transfer RNAs, so different forms of RNA. RNA is much more versatile than DNA. DNA basically just sits inside the nucleus and maintains the code, okay, the order of the, uh, of the, the base pairs. RNA then does all the work, really. This takes the code out into the cytosol via the mRNA, and you'll see where they all are. The tRNAs bind each individual amino acid at the three prime position here. And this is a wound up double helical uh, nucleic acid material like DNA, but it forms this crazy looking clover leaf structure. There's 70 or 80 base pairs here, and some of them are hydrogen bonding uh, complementary here in the A 
in, in the one, two, three, four region. In the three region, we have the anticodon that's needed to tell uh, the, the ribosome what amino acid is up here, okay? So you'll see this amino acid, the specific one, there's 20 of them, right? Corresponds to a specific code, triplet code down here on the three position of the tRNA. So there are synthases that make these tRNAs and put the specific amino acids right, right there. So here's the first connection, uh, you could say covalently between genetic material and proteins, but it's just the individual amino acid. So there are 20 of these uh, tRNAs. They're a little bit different. They correspond to specific amino acids and they have different anti-codes down here in this three region, okay? So, we're, we're, we don't stop there. We have mRNA, tRNA, and what's the other one? Yeah, rRNA. What's that? That's way down here at the bottom, this big green blob back here. This is the ribosome. This is a very large enzyme, and it's not a protein. It's an enzyme that's based on nucleic acid material, purely RNA. It functions as the catalyst to put the individual tRNAs together and make the actual protein peptide chain, and here it is. These purple balls right here are the individual amino acids coming in, okay? So we have the individual amino acids up here. So here's one coming in that has phenylalanine on it. Here's one that's already on the template here. So here's the messenger RNA that's the template for the tRNAs binding to the anticodon region. And then it allows for the new amide bond to form here between the individual amino acids off here. And the amino acids are hooked to the tRNAs via the three prime hydroxyl. So that's what type of functional group, right? It's an ester, okay? And then esters are more reactive than what? Amides. So it's creating a more stable amide at the expense of an ester. We'll need to see the details of that. You've probably seen this in other classes, right? You got the coding part here, the messenger RNA. It's read from the three prime or the five prime to the three prime position. It always starts with methionine. That's always the first one, tRNA-wise. And once it forms the amide bond, then the tRNA gets out of the way. The ester is hydrolyzed, and then uh, the ribosome moves down the mRNA chain, messenger RNA, and then it links in the next tRNA that corresponds to the next sequence for that amino acid. So we've got UUC coming up. And where's the U come from? Well, the U is the thymidine version in RNA. And the U, the uracil, is just demethylated at that position. So instead of thymidine, it has uh, the desmethyl or the demethylated uh, 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 pyrimidine there. So UUC corresponds to AAG here. And it's that base pairing, that triplet codon base pairing, which will allow the amide bond between what? Uh, aspartic acid and phenylalanine right there. That'll be the next amino acid. Um, these cartoon pictures are fine, but the molecular details is what you need to know here <laughs> as an organic chemist. So here's the rest of the story we can say, right? So here's a tRNA, that three prime position is exposed there. That's on the sugar, on the ribose. The uh, tRNA synthase uh, puts on a specific amino acid that corresponds to that coding region at the bottom of the tRNA. So there's an ester of an amino acid, right? We got our alpha amino group. There's our carboxylate that's it's now an ester at the three prime position. It initiates when it sees the mRNA code when it starts there. And there's a lot of stuff, uh, you know, enzymes and control, whatever you learn about in biochem, how the the gene starts at the different position. There's start codons and all that stuff. The, the main start codon is AUG, and that corresponds to methionine. These chains always start with methionine at the uh, N-terminal position. And the synthesis does go from the N-terminus on the left toward the C-terminus on the right. It's just the opposite of the lab synthesis that you saw, the Merrifield synthesis, where we did it with DCC and the Bach-protected amino acids on solid support. That goes from the C terminus to the N. This goes a different direction. Each tRNA brings it in as an ester here. So that's the initiation part. And then there's also recognition elements here for the next one. This is called the elongation step. So then the next tRNA comes in here. The methionine is the first one you see. Here's the next one coming in. It has the corresponding three triplet code here. And this one initially is an ammonium cation 
but the enzyme, the ribosome, takes off a proton from the ammonium that allows a pair of electrons to come in and attack the ester that forms what? The tetrahedral intermediate right here. The same thing we've been looking at, that tetrahedral intermediate can collapse down, protonate the tRNA hydroxyl, and there it is coming off. There's the finished tRNA. And we've what? We've got a dipeptide now. We've got two amides there. Deprotonate the amine again to give the neutral amide. And then it happens again, okay? Now it goes to a tripeptide. Same thing, here's the spent tRNA comes off there. And then uh, new esters formed, right? And that can keep going. So N can be hundreds or even thousands long, okay? Very long here. Each coding region, each tRNA is unique for each individual amino acid, right? Until it hits a stop codon or UGA. There's a couple other stop codons you'll see in a minute. Uh, there's no tRNA that recognizes that. It stalls at that point and allows a hydrolase to hydrolyze that last ester to give you the free peptide. That peptide can then fold up, you know, and form the intact globular protein, or if it's a fibrous protein, it'll fold up or wind up with a fiber. But there you go. We're going from genetic material, the code here on the mRNA, the red band here, the little black part of the tRNA is that three position down that has the anti-codon, actually it's called. <laughs> uh, and we'll see that here in a second. Okay, so there's these codon charts. Maybe you've seen this. Uh, this specifies then for each individual amino acid. Here's the start codon, AUG. They're always in triplets here. So A, U, G, there it is right there, for methionine, okay? And that's how you read this chart. Here's the first one, here's the uh, second one, and then the third ones are in blue in each uh, field there. And there was the N codon, uh, U A G or UAA is an end or, or stop codon. It's a redundant code. Some amino acids have multiple codes you can see here, so it can tolerate different uh, mutations there that, that protect the organism. It has to have quite a few mutations within the DNA or the RNA to get a change in an amino acid at a different spot. But here's how it looks. Here's our messenger RNA. UAG is the start thing for methionine, right? So U A U G methionine. What's the next one? G U U. Here it is. G U U valine. Yep. A C A. Where's that? A C a, there it is, ACA is threonine, okay? Asparagine is that next one, AAU, AAU, asparagine, yep. And then what's this last one? Oh, GGG, G, GGG, oh, G, oh, G, it's glycine. There you go, GGG glycine. <laughs> and then what's UAA? Isn't there another one here? Ah, uh, UAA, ah, that's a stop codon. That does not put in an amino acid. There's no tRNAs there. It, it stalls and then allows for the hydrolysis of the ester at that point. So some people, some students will put stop there. No, there's no stop amino acid, okay? <laughs> you just don't put anything there. That's the stop codon, you should know that. The start codon does have an amino acid, methionine, okay? If we asked you to produce a peptide or whatever from a given sequence, we'd give you this chart, okay? So on test four here, if we have one of these type of problems, you'd see the chart. You need to know how to analyze the structure and just look back through it and have an idea of, uh, of how translation, transcription, and, and replication work. So yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not showing transcription. Transcription uses the DNA uh, single strand, the code for that, to do the... Uh, the code then for the messenger RNA strand, okay? And you'll learn more details about that in biochem. So there we're already showing it made, okay, the messenger RNA. Uh, the ribosomal RNA, which is very prevalent in cells, and these are big enzymes. And remember, they're not proteins, they're nucleic acid material. You can actually see them with a the microscope. There's a couple things you can see with a microscope inside of a cell. You can see glycogen particles, the things we just talked about, the polyglucose, and you can see these uh, ribosome particles also inside of a cell. But here's how they operate, right? There's three things working here, tRNAs, mRNA, that's two, and then, yeah, rRNA, ribosomal RNA, yeah. 
in, uh, in the code thing, depending on how that works, yeah. So yeah, proteins can be hundreds or thousands long. And they depend on this open reading frames, the coding region of DNA, it's called cDNA, that codes for specific uh, proteins. Most regions of DNA don't code for anything. They're called junk DNA regions. <laughs> Sorry about that. Most of your DNA is junk. So when someone tells you, oh, I've got it in my DNA, my response is always, oh, you've got a lot of junk in your DNA? Well, they do. <laughs> uh, but the coding regions are important, right? Uh, and they're the ones that, that actually make protein. So that's what we're talking about there. Okay, I think that's good. I think that's enough on that. Um, yeah, so stay tuned here for chapter 28, which will be coming up. Oh, we got a demonstration. Oh, <laughs> thank you for reminding <laughs> me. Sometimes I let these demos go by. <laughs> We're going to look at gun cotton here. Oh, there's a good thing. This is smokeless gunpowder. And this is just taking uh, starch. And uh, remember, starch has a lot of uh, alcohols in it, right? Polymeric, polyglucose here. So glucose, polymeric here. And remember, uh, cotton is what? Uh, cellulose. So it's going to be, uh, what, 1, 4, beta or alpha? It's going to be uh, beta, right? It's going to be that equatorial link thing. And you treat uh, uh, cotton or, or the cellulose fiber with nitric acid uh, and sulfuric acid. Oh, we've seen those reagents before. Nitric acid, sulfuric acid, what does that make? Yeah, it makes the nitronium cation. And we saw that. That's how we nitrate benzene. Well, you can nitrate other things here, too. You can make uh, nitro groups on every hydroxyl group on gun cotton. Okay? So it's, it's converted in here. Let's look at regular cotton first. They've got a couple different types of cotton. Here's a cotton ball, which is just all cellulose, woody fibers. It's kind of nice here. Let's see. Does it burn? Uh, yes, it does. Does the camera see that? Okay. Burns quite slowly. Uh, sugars do burn. You probably realize that from cooking, whatever. Burns quite slowly, but it's a sustained flame. Now, if all of your clothing is made out of just native cotton fibers, that would be a problem. And a number of people passed away in the early days when they started making a lot of clothes out of cotton. And uh, that can be, of course, a big problem. So what was done is they treat cotton with boric acid, and it forms borate linkages between the hydroxyls. And the borate functions as a, a flame retardant material. So here's cotton or a cellulose that's been treated with boric acid. And you can see it doesn't really sustain a flame. It kind of chars a little bit but that ball doesn't burn up completely like the other ball we just did. All right, that's two types of cotton <laughs> or cellulose. Now, gun cotton. So this was invented, I think, in France about 250 years ago or so, nitrating the, the fibers here. And you got to watch very carefully. <laughs> this is going to happen really quick. Okay, <laughs> so this is nitrocellulose or gun cotton. Okay, yeah. So another Harry Potter type demo. So <laughs> went very quickly there. And why is that? Well, you've got these nitro groups on here. So any heat or flame will convert this into CO, CO2, NO, NO2 very quickly. In fact, you'll get a detonation type thing or a conflagration, it's called. So you're not actually just combusting it. You're actually making a bunch of these, uh, these small uh, uh, things there. And, and you see that expansion of the flame creates a lot of pressure. And it's smokeless. You didn't see any black soot coming out of that. So in the old days, uh, gunpowder made out of uh, charcoal and saltpeter and sulfur uh, gives a lot of black smoke. Well, this is also called smokeless gunpowder. It can be used in ordinances in different uh, uh, applications and bullets and, and ordinances, whatever. But I think this is more gun cotton. Let's see. This is a bigger ball, so I hope I don't catch myself on fire. But again, you got to watch carefully. Maybe we could turn the lights off in the room and see uh, 
see it a little better here. Oh, here we go. Okay, so <laughs> let's see how this shows up on your camera. So gun cotton again. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very dramatic. Anyway, a lot of applications of cellulose and starch. It's from cellulose, right? Because it's uh, the one for beta linked being equatorial there. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. I <laughs> almost forgot. <laughs> Good thing my director was paying attention there. And yeah, I think we've covered everything we need there in uh, in those chapters, uh, covering sugars quite thoroughly. Now, our last chapter, like I said, is this 28 here, uh, lipids. We've already had some in that, but uh, test four now coming up will mainly be these two chapters, 26 and 27. Just a little bit in 28 and, and maybe a little bit on metabolism, not much. But we're, we're just going to visit glycolysis, citric acid cycle, uh, just to point out the reactions we've covered uh, in previous chapters. And then the final, be preparing for that now, of course. The sample final is already online. Our final will be 70 multiple choice questions. Uh, it's normalized to 200 points, so a lot of points yet to go. So keep uh, keep studying, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.